Dr. Yap, it's an honor to have you here. Please welcome Dr. Yap. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, Mattis and the minister inviting us here uh, at PepsiCo to present on behalf of our PepsiCo research and development organization. As you know, PepsiCo um, takes its pride on doing research, but doing research right in a way we call performance with purpose. And performance with purpose basically is doing the right thing for the environment and doing the right thing for our, our people. So if you look at all of our products that we have throughout the world, we try to make our products healthier for our people, but you also try to do the right thing for our environment and, to the, and do the right thing for our, our talent within our own organization. If you combine that with the research and technology, we have a powerful uh, force uh, in our science and innovation plan. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, my lens through the PepsiCo organization. As you, as you know, PepsiCo is a very large organization. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, brands within the organization, and I'm going to talk to you about research and development from two to five years out in food and beverage uh, innovation. We have over 22 brands, over a billion dollars. Uh, we have $65 billion, over $65 billion worth of sales, and we have 330,000, roughly around 330,000 employees. So we have a large organization uh, with a lot of brands uh, and, and a lot of uh, innovation within those brands. Each brand that we have has its own personality, so it's almost like you're doing research for all those different brands, and each one of those brands have, has different challenges. But what does it take to actually get a product into the market and get a product to a brand? There's a lot of challenges we face in the, in the food and science organization, but it's not just food and science. There's a lot of things that we go through uh, uh, into getting these into the, into the shelf. And what we try to practice in PepsiCo is what we call science to practice. How do you actually take something very scientific into a product that can deliver innovation and move forward so that consumers have an interest in that product ongoing for the long term. So today I'm going to talk about a lot of different areas. I'm not going to touch, uh, because of the time, I'm not going to touch about everything that PepsiCo does, but I do want to talk about what today's challenges are. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in the food and beverage industry. I'm going to tap on into a couple of those. Uh, that are relevant to us today, and then uh, we can talk about, through the question and answer period, some of the other challenges that we face. I'm going to touch on the discovery part, because the reason we're here in Iceland is not only to, uh, that we have an interest in partnering with Mattis, but also because we have an interest in this, in this area for a lot of different areas that what, what nature offers us in discovery and ingredient research, and what we can do with nature, and how do we take that into our product development arena. So, talk a little bit about the discovery area, and then I'll talk about taste and functionality. No matter what we do at PepsiCo, uh, if our products aren't going to a, a healthy arena, but also do if they taste great, if they don't taste great, then we don't have a, really have a product. So I'm going to talk about how we address taste and functionality, and then what are the areas uh, that we're moving into, such as personalization. So what does nutrigenomics mean to the food and beverage industry, and, and what does that mean to, uh, into areas such as this for Iceland? and then understand the consumer better than we ever have before. We at PepsiCo take pride in trying to understand the consumer, whether the consumer is, a, uh, is an elderly person or whether the consumer is an athlete. Uh, we have a lot of brands that serve multiple consumers. Today I'm going to give you an example of our Gatorade brand where uh, it serves not only elite athletes, but athletes all, all around the world. And how do we actually understand that athlete and develop products uh, for the consumer there? And then. I'll, I'll uh, end off with some things that we're looking to uh, in the future. So what are the challenges that we actually face today? Well, we have a lot of uh, challenges that uh, address uh, different opportunities, but we're going to need to cross-fertilize to address some of these challenges. These challenges aren't easy. Um, it's going to take cross-fertilization of different industries, so you'll see uh, PepsiCo not only partner with a company such as Amatis, but we'll partner with other companies around the world such as technology companies such as a Philips or an IBM or Cisco Systems to address these challenges. A challenge that we face in the food industry is almost everyone's challenge. We're going to need multiple technologies to, to really be able to address a lot of these different uh, areas as, as we move forward. 
and cross-fertilization is definitely needed, as like I mentioned earlier, in different disciplines. So at PepsiCo, in, at least in my organization, we have uh, not only chemists and biologists, we have material scientists, physicists, engineers, uh, statisticians, analysts, uh, medical doctors, uh, biologists, uh, you name it, that we have those different diversified talent in our group to address these challenges. But the challenges aren't just based upon we're doing everything internally. We need to partner with not only leading universities, but leading uh, companies such as Mattis to address these challenges as, as we move forward. Under, understand the consumer is key. And when I mean understand the consumers, I mean really looking at uh, not only consumer insights, but what we call consumer foresights. What's actually happening around the corner? When it, what's actually happening uh, with our consumers they don't even know they need yet? Uh, so what are the opportunities there? And I'll, talk, I'll touch a little bit about that uh, as we move forward and towards the presentation. And sustainability is always going to play a major role, whether it's human sustainability or environmental sustainability. This is always key for us uh, as we move forward in, uh, in our quest uh, for innovation. So what are some of the, uh, today's challenges that we're facing? Well, uh, the, the balancing of the economic world. We're seeing a lot of cities getting larger. Uh, there's some cities, such as New York City, Shanghai, that are getting over 8, 10, 18 billion, dollar, billion people uh, moving forward. There's just, just a lot of different areas that, uh, that we need to invest in. But also the, the populations are moving west. And they're also moving south that are growing larger and larger. How do we address these consumers as we move forward? Uh, the change in demographic equation also. There's more... Uh, for example, elderly that we have ever had before. Do we have products at PepsiCo to address the elderly? Uh, so we have to really think about that. The woman, the woman consumer is actually getting, is getting stronger as, as, as time goes by. So we're really addressing what does the woman want as the, almost the head of household in a lot of the countries that we serve around PepsiCo. So we're, we're addressing those also. And then uh, there's also the health and wellness piece. Health and wellness is not a trend. It's, it's actually, it's here to stay, and we're always going to continue working on our health and wellness initiatives. So how do we reduce fat, salt, and sugar in our products? And I'll address uh, some of the areas that we do that. But an important part of addressing fat, salt, and sugar is, is looking at other ingredients that nature gives us to be able to, uh, to address. So how do we replace salt? How do we take sodium and chloride for example, out of our products and still make the product taste great, it tastes like full salt, but utilizing other ingredients. I think Iceland is a, a fertile uh, area for us to look to, especially in the, in the marine world, uh, of how do we address, uh, for example, uh, things that uh, utilize uh, sodium chloride in our, in our products. And then all pervasive web. Uh, today, the web is everywhere. Everything gets twittered. Nothing is, is, can, can be hidden. Everything is out in the open. How do we uh, look at that from an opportunist point of view to really look at uh, how do we address the consumer of tomorrow? And then the new shopper consumer. What is the new shopper consumer of today and what is the new shopper consumer gonna be tomorrow? Well, uh, shipping uh, water and bags around the world and potatoes, oranges and oats around the world is maybe it's not uh, the best thing to do uh, for the future. So uh, the new sharp consumer possibly uh, could be uh, getting most of the products over the web or shipped to the door. I mean, Amazon.com is, is going to overtake Walmart pretty soon, especially in the United States and a lot of uh, the consumer products that we deliver. So are we prepared ourselves as a uh, consumer products goods company to address the new shopper and the consumer? And also the new shop consumer is really educated in what they buy. So we have to be uh, very upfront with them on the products that we sell from a nutritious point of view, but packaging point of view, but also from an ingredient point of view. What are they actually buying? Because uh, the consumer today is very, very educated on what they buy. And then personalization. There's going to be a day that the products that we sell are personalized just to you. And uh, because of today's economy, because of today's limited ingredients, we have to look at areas of personalization to you because it's not only uh, from an ingredient point of view, but from a product point of view, a personalized product to you uh, generates less waste, but it's also more efficient to what you want to use it for. So 
really looking at that, are we preparing ourselves to look in the area of personalization? I know other companies are also, but because we have things such as nutrigenomics and areas like that, uh, we, re we should be really addressing these areas. But how do you actually do it in the masses? We reach uh, almost a billion consumers a day. So how do we do that and make it personalized to you? So there's areas that we'll work on, especially in our vending machines and our coolers, that when you walk up to that cooler, it recognizes you, and it recognizes you, and hopefully in the near future, it will have a beverage just made for you, a Pepsi Max that's based for you and your taste, or a, a juice drink or a, a, a snack or a product that's based for your recommendations of what you want by just recognizing your face or recognizing something that you wear. Uh, so that's coming in the near future. Uh, and then scarcity, uncertainty, and global resources. Really need to look at uh, how do we utilize water, how do we utilize energy. PepsiCo itself, we have, we have two plants that are almost 100% solar in our SunChips facility uh, in the United States. And we have uh, the largest fleet of electric vehicles out there in the world to deliver uh, to our consumers and deliver to our products around the world. So we're really looking at uh, more efficient production. Uh, we're also looking at areas such as we call no-touch production, where actually there's really no one in the production plant. Everything is self-sufficient and automated that we can get our products out there. So that's where our goal is to get there and actually get more efficient in those specific areas. And then more accelerate technology disruptions. What can we do in the food or beverage to really change the game? Instead of just changing color and flavor, of a product, what are we actually going to do for that product to serve that consumer, whether it's in the package, whether it's in, um, in personalization, whether it's in uh, multiple areas. I'm going to go over a little bit of that, what we do with our Gatorade line. And then we have, and Horta just mentioned, uh, an area of talent concern. Uh, we have a lot, especially in the United States, a lot of talent concerns about a lot of our talent is is going towards more finance and more towards uh, the business side, where we really don't have uh, we have a gap of creative scientists that we need to really solve some of our challenges in the future. I mean, I see a lot of resumes on a daily and a weekly basis, but uh, we're going to have a gap pretty soon about where we're going to find the best food scientists, chemists, and biologists around the world uh, to work at a company such as PepsiCo, where we have 300,000 employees and we have a large R&D organization that we really need to get products out there. So. It's, uh, it's going to be a challenge for us to get, get the right talent uh, and also uh, really you get them to understand the pure science of what we're doing. Uh, because a lot of challenges we're facing today aren't written about in books, um, and then they're not very easy, because if they were easy, we would have done the, we would have solved these already. So almost everything that we talk about in our R&D organization, you can understand from a chemistry and biology point of view, but really uh, they're not written about in, in papers yet or in books. Uh, a lot of the chemistry when I went to graduate school is being rewritten today. Reactions that took probably 10 to 15 steps, we can do in three steps now through areas such as synthetic biology. Reactions that we're told that can never happen are happening today in, in specific areas. Um, and it's fascinating uh, about the merge of chemistry and biology and physics in the different areas and how we're approaching that and bringing that into uh, the food science and food and beverage uh, areas. So, I can touch a little bit about it today, but uh, there's a lot more that I can answer in, in the question uh, area also. So what about new taste and new taste imperatives? Well, a lot of what we do at PepsiCo, we try to, what we do, localization of ingredients. Ingredients that we would find in Iceland, ingredients that we'd find in China, in North America, we try to, instead of shipping our ingredients around the world, and trying to, for you to adapt to our taste, we try to adapt to your local taste. So really looking at uh, taste imperatives and what are, do local tastes mean for our consumers. So really looking from an ingredient point of view, but what nature offers in that area to really deliver that product. Obviously we have certain specs that we have to uh, meet and certain safety criteria we have to meet with our products, but uh, our formulas change around the world so they can adapt uh, to your sensory experience. So it's not just about taste, it's also about functionality. If we're looking at ingredients for performance or ingredients for mental acuity or ingredients for energy, uh, that's also very relevant in, in our localization area. So 
Uh, I'll address a little bit about what we do with our global trekking, where we send uh, groups around the world to really look at these ingredients and how do we uh, take what nature gives us and really study what nature gives us and appreciate that and then bring that to product innovation. And then I'm going to talk about uh, areas that, from the culinary piece, where uh, we really look at what local chefs do or what local cooks do with these ingredients. And why are they creating uh, dishes that are low in fat, uh, low in sugar, and low in salt, but they taste great? How do they do that? And can we translate into, for example, PepsiCo products? And now, what are we doing in our agroscience arena? So ingredient hunting really combines the area of scientific innovation, biodiversity, and ingenious knowledge, and indigenous knowledge. So we really need to look at, when we look at and go to a local area, for example, last year we spent a lot of time in western China to look at ingredients, but really understand what do the local uh, chefs and the local cooks do with these ingredients. And we've also found out that a lot of the ingredients that you read about are necessarily accurate in the text when we actually go out there that says it may taste sweet, but it actually tastes savory. So we feel that we want to invest a lot of our time and efforts to really discover and understand what nature offers us, but not reading a book and not sitting behind a desk, but really going out to really remote areas to understand what could be our next sweetener for Pepsi Max, or what could be our next salt reduction compound, or what could be something that could replace fat holistically in a product to make our products healthier? What other ingredients can we use uh, to help us in, uh, in our whole grain area or in other areas of fruits and vegetables? Uh, what other fruits and vegetables we can use in our snack products uh, to live, deliver healthier, healthier products? So that's uh, very important with our ingredient global trekking area. And we go around the world. Uh, where you see the big circles is areas of a lot of biodiversity. We have big teams out there really looking at these ingredients. But also <clears throat> areas such as Iceland are important to us, like I mentioned earlier, because of, of the natural products that you offer here and what can we utilize those for, for example, in salt reduction, fat, or in sugar, or in other areas of functionality in packaging and so forth. So, a lot of opportunity here. Um, I know this is the first time I um, spent a long time, uh, multiple days in Iceland, and, and, and we really want to take this time to really understand what, what uh, this area has to offer for a company such as PepsiCo, and we're really excited about that. Um, but the ingredient hunting really goes also down to the molecular level. Um, we really can go down to uh, look at what traditional molecules uh, will give us uh, what local recipes can give us and, and exploration in, in different areas. And a lot of these areas have recipes that are over a thousand years old that we use current science and analytics to actually validate if they are, are truly uh, valid for what they say they're going to be using for. For example, traditional Chinese medicines are over thousands of years old, but we can use current science to validate if it does, for example, give you mental acuity or energy and so forth, um, which is the exciting thing about it. Because um, we can go down to molecular level, we can actually see exactly how these molecules can react in the body. So we have a biology facility um, at PepsiCo that can look at areas such as metabolomics, proteomics, and things like that to really uh, understand what happens to the molecules as it's broken down, what receptors it actually hits, for example, in taste. So utilizing things such as high throughput screening in areas uh, for that to really screen some of these molecules. And also microscopy. I was reading, uh, there's a science article that's going to be coming out, I believe, in the next month, where you actually, it's the first time as an organic chemist, I can actually see a reaction uh, in the bonds making and breaking of a molecule such as benzene or so forth. It's phenomenal that what you can see today in, 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 in microscopy. And that's the first time we're able to see that in, ever. Uh, in, in the science arena. So what can we utilize that science for as we look at incorporating some of these molecules naturally uh, uh, that are found in nature into, into food? And these are uh, some pictures of some very remote areas that we're looking at, some of the natural ingredients that aren't reported in the literature, but we're finding some really unique molecules and properties uh, of these ingredients that we can possibly utilize in the future in, in future PepsiCo products. And then the culinary science is, is very important to us. Like I mentioned earlier, what are the ingredients that the local chefs or local cooks or local 
than what they're at home utilizing to make these products taste very delicious. And, uh, and you'd be very surprised. They use relatively low salt, low fat, or low sugar outside the U.S. Uh, to really make these products uh, taste great. And how can we really look at those and really look and embrace those and, and bring those into products in the future? And then really take plants, and, what, and this is a machine that usually in a chemistry biology lab, if you take a natural product, a natural product's chemistry, uh, to get a, a graduate student to extract something down to a molecular level could take months to do. And we have machines now that, uh, high throughput machines that can actually take it down and can do it in days or hours. So thousands and thousands of fractions within uh, in a day that we can look at. So we can really go through a lot of different fruits and vegetables and natural ingredients uh, very, very fast to look at that needle in the haystack to be able to move forward and to find the right ingredient for our products. And then utilize uh, the chemistry that chefs are doing. Chefs are doing chemistry, we just don't know that, they just possibly don't know they're doing it and really capturing midstream and live at what chefs are actually doing. We have a big culinary event coming up in uh, Napa Valley, California that we're really capturing uh, through video and analytical techniques and, fiber, and fibers and so forth that really collect the molecules that our chefs are forming before, during, and after their cooking process, and then translate those back into uh, product development areas. And then what do we do with those ingredients? Well, we have uh, human sustainability commitments that we've made at PepsiCo. For example, in, um, in our salt, salty snacks, we're going to reduce salt by 25% by 2015 uh, uh, by taking the, the salt out, but really not uh, affecting the taste of most of our products at PepsiCo. So how do we do that? It's not very easy, um, but so we have to look, look at utilizing processing and natural ingredients to be able to really do that to move that forward. And 2015 is coming up, so uh, we really have to get on the ball to be able to achieve that. And we have same, uh, similar sustainability goals for, sh for sugar and for fat. Uh, this is something we also did in South Africa where not only did we embrace what we were doing in salt, but we actually taught medium and small size companies what we were doing in salt reduction technology. So really shared the technology with a lot of other companies that can help uh, solve some of the challenges that we face uh, in salt. And we're gonna do a lot of some of these other ones around the world also in some of these forums. And then in the agro space, we're really truly seed to fork. Uh, we raise our own potatoes, we harvest potatoes, we look at size and shape and flavor of our potato into, um, into the actual product of the potato chip and crisp. We do something very similar for oat and very similar for our oranges in Florida and our oranges in Brazil. So very similar to Cedar Fork, we have a strong breeding program right now and we're actually building it up as we speak in specific areas to not look at just size and shape, but also to look at flavor and texture and functionality of those uh, ingredients as we move forward. And then really looking at um, ingredients and plants and fruits and vegetables so that we can crossbreed, uh, not from genetics, but also understand the genetics of each one and naturally crossbreeding those to move forward. For example, to find the best sweetener out there for our their food and beverages or the next uh, functional ingredient. Um, and then the area of personalization that leads uh, to areas that we do in taste and, and naturals is, is important to us as we move forward. So what are we doing in the area of, why do consumers, uh, what do they think of salt, sweet, and sugar? Not just can we deliver that ingredient, but what, are the, what does the consumer think about that? Uh, what are the biological response to sweet, salt, and fat? So what actually happens when you eat a natural sweetener compared to an artificial sweetener compared to uh, different high intensity sweeteners out there or a modification. Uh, same with salt and fat, we try to understand that. Um, and also, what does the flavor do? Does the flavor really change your mood and emotion? Uh, can we utilize mood and emotion to really have you look at products um, or understand the consumer better in those specific areas? And then what about texture and mouthfeel? Stefan is a my colleague, Stefan Barrett, is an expert in texture and mouthfeel and tribology. 
uh, for our different food products. So it's not just about taste, but how does it feel in your mouth? Does it feel natural? And uh, what are we looking at from a texture and mouthfeel point of view? And then nutrigenomics is important to us, uh, really, because of the discovery of the human genome. Uh, what are the different genes and how are they expressed in your body? And uh, are, so we're studying exactly the area of, of that. And can we look at that to really give you uh, a personalized product? Or can you understand what's actually happening? Or can we uh, customize that for you? Um, right now, we don't have products in, in those areas. but. Uh, the food and beverage area is moving towards personalization. It's not just PepsiCo, but most all of the leading organizations. So uh, what can we understand here to actually uh, give you customization? And then what are the ingredients out there? If you look at the circles here, the larger the circle, the more studies have been done with these specific ingredients, but do they really work? Um, PepsiCo is not going to bring a product out there if it's not based on credible science. Uh, so when you have a product that's kind of on the fence, then what do you do about that product? And what do you do about an ingredient that somewhat works but doesn't work at the level that it's applied to in food? So there's a lot of questions out there about uh, ingredients, but also uh, what does an ingredient do? And as a, you know, vitamin D for you might not be this, the same effect as a vitamin D for someone else. So how do we try to understand that? And we have large studies going on there to truly understand not just these ingredients, but several other ingredients out there. And then can you bring that to a product and start focusing those ingredients into a product or that technology and product? And this is now the start of us thinking about how can we bring this into the sports nutrition area. And we realize there's different athletes around the world, whether you're a walker, a weekend warrior, or an elite athlete. Can we customize those products for you uh, for these specific areas. So there's a lot of things that you need to study there, but it's also understanding the consumer, not, not just about taste, but in this case, it's about taste, functionality, and performance. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about, okay, how do we take some of this technology and move it into a brand? So one of our brands, Gatorade, is over a $5 billion brand, uh, very heavily U.S.-based. However, uh, it's expanding rapidly you know, around the world. Uh, for different athletes. But what we try to understand is we, we're starting to understand that every athlete's different, but every sport's different. So a footballer here is not exactly the same as a footballer in the U.S. Uh, a golfer here is not exactly the same as a golfer in the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, a skier here is different. And then different athletes around the world are trained differently. And then not only with, within the sport, you have positions within the sport that uh, an athlete requirements are different. So when you combine that all, how do you actually get a product that meets everyone's needs? So that's a big challenge. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're trying to do at Gatorade. So Gatorade, if you look at the left side, um, a lot of the, especially the younger athletes, think they can train 98% of the time and then don't worry about their sports nutrition at all. And they think they can win gold or silver. But what we saw this past year, and especially in the London, Olympics and before that is the model on the right side. The ones that were winning gold really took training seriously, but they also took their sports nutrition seriously. And that's a space that Gatorade, uh, as a brand, we would play in to really achieve some of our goals. So also to serve the athlete in needs that they never thought they needed before to actually perform and to win that gold. So what we did is to really understand the consumer we set Gatorade sports science labs around the world to immerse ourselves where the athletes train. So in the, for example, in the US, where do most athletes train? Uh, in Florida. So we set up a lab in Florida where we can immerse ourselves in a lab where athletes train in a facility that we can understand athletes and bring them in and really test them in their natural environment. And when you test an athlete in their natural environment, just like any other consumer, you get better data. And when you get better data, you can get, and get better product innovation and product delivery for that athlete. We also built a facility at Loughborough University, UK, just before the Olympics. So we saw most Olympic athletes there. Uh, we also are looking at Brazil, and we're looking at a place for cold weather sports too, right now. So really looking at the gamut of different areas to really understand consumer. And this is just one brand. So if we take this and multiply it by 22 brand, brands that are over a billion dollars for PepsiCo, we're doing something very similar to understanding consumers. But in this case, Gatorade brand, immersing yourself with athletes to understand the consumer. 
uh, not only do we build labs within where, where athletes train, but where athletes will, will hang out and train. So the biggest stage, in, at least in the United States, for football is the Super Bowl. So we build a lab uh, at the Super Bowl here, but to train athletes that show up to the Super Bowl, but also, but also to collect data that's important to us for product innovation. Uh, this is a, our facility in Florida where um, we actually test athletes. But you see the lab on the left side is our lab, but the right side is our real lab. So the ultimate goal here is to test the athlete on the field of play to really study that athlete. So when the athlete's running and training, can we wirelessly uh, detect what, what's happening in their performance? So you'll see more of the technology come out where you'll see patches on the athlete that are wirelessly going to our iPhone or iPad to really give us uh, some, some, um, some information out there. Uh, this is inside the lab, um, and I'm going to uh, play just a little video of um, of the labs. Also, our athlete, in, our, our labs in uh, Europe and Loughborough, and then collecting into the database. Great athletes are always looking for an edge something to take them to that next level and improve their performance. At the Gatorade Sports Science Institute at IMG Academy, with our expertise in nutrition and hydration for sports performance, we're here to help athletes better understand their unique physiology in order to reach their goals. The Gatorade Sports Science Institute is a research division of the Gatorade Company. Our goal is to conduct research on athletes to gain a better understanding of what the athlete's needs are to actually help them improve their performance through hydration and nutrition. GSSI tests athletes of all levels, including those that are in the all-star games of professional sports, all the way down to the 13-year-old amateur. In 2011, GSSI opened its first satellite laboratory at IMG Academy in Bradenton, Florida. Athletes that live and train at IMG Academy have the opportunity to be tested. Each athlete has their own individual potential. You can't reach that potential without proper hydration and nutrition. Proper fuel and hydration is important for athletes due to the fact that their body is made up mostly of water that you lose as the body sweats. Nutrition is important because nutrition is what fuels the body. As the fuel turns to energy, the body is able to carry out motion and activity. So when the fuel is running low, the body can't produce the energy needed. Everyone is looking for a way to get an edge on their competition. The athletes who come to the Gatorade Sports Science Institute learn about how small changes in their training and their nutrition can give them the edge they need. So when an athlete enters the lab, the first thing we do is we look at their height and weight and then look at their body composition. From there, we look at markers of metabolism of the body. After that, we see how their body has changed from using fat at rest to requiring more carbohydrate later during exercise. We look at the athlete's cognitive function, their ability to multitask and respond to stimuli. Following that, we move to see how their whole body reaction time is. We're looking at muscle strength, and finally, we're looking at anaerobic power and fatigue. After an athlete has been tested in the laboratory, the scientists create a report about the athlete's individual results. The scientists show the athlete where the areas of strength and where the areas of opportunity, taking their information about their own physiology back to their strength and conditioning coaches, back to their sports medicine staff, back to their nutrition staff, they're better able to customize programs so that the athlete's able to work smarter rather than just harder. Therefore, every rep, every sprint, every drill, everything they put in their body really counts. The athlete can feel confident that they've armed themselves with all the tools they need to leave it all on the field of play. Undergoing performance testing at the Gatorade Sports Science Institute gives athletes an invaluable look at how nutrition and hydration can change their game help them reach their goals, and become the best athletes they can be. So this is my last slide. Um, so thanks for uh, listening today about some of our challenges, uh, some of the technology we're embracing. Uh, obviously, I couldn't talk about everything because of the time, but I'd be happy to answer any questions in those specific areas. How do we translate some of the things we're doing into a big brand such as Gatorade? Uh, and to truly understand the consumer. So everything we do to understand the consumer and then translate it to a product for that consumer. And then looking at the future. So looking at what we can do uh, for our consumers in the future, like uh, 
partnering with Mattis and uh, doing more here at Iceland um, and doing more uh, for areas such as in foresight and technology. So thanks every, thank you for uh, listening and, and thanks very much. In your presentation, Dr. Yev, you mentioned multiple technology. You mentioned challenges. Uh, you also uh, mentioned what uh, do the women want. I found that interesting because uh, they seem to want something else. Uh, you talked about the talent gap. You talked about the new taste. And I sometimes wondered, what is the taste of Iceland? We, re we recently saw a, a, <clears throat> a Simpson series <clears throat> and we saw Homer Simpson taste a rotten shark. <laughs> and I wondered, should that be the taste of Iceland in, in people's minds? I hope not. But uh, it's in, it would be interesting for us to hear what you think about Iceland. Where, where do you see the opportunities here? First to you, Dr. Yev. Um, are you here as an investor searching for opportunities? Or, or uh, are we more looking into uh, collaborative inter innovation with Matis? Um, uh, please uh, elaborate a little. Um, Iceland's very interesting to us because, you know, when we look at, we always look at biodiversity in those specific areas I showed to around the world, especially in Asia and South America and so forth. But uh, coming here is very interesting to us because of the, the wealth of uh, natural products that Iceland offers uh, in the areas of seafood, in the areas in, in marine life um, that are very interesting to us. We have libraries that we screen uh, for ingredients that are based on uh, marine life, whether it's coral, seaweed, and, and some of these other areas that are, we find very interesting natural ingredients for. Now, can we uh, understand those natural ingredients and, and move them into product innovation? We think we can. Uh, that are, would have a benefit to the consumer, whether it's from a taste point of view or whether you saw there in Gatorade from a performance point of view. There's a lot of different ingredients out there that uh, we're studying uh, down to the molecular level naturally to be able to, to move into our product. So this is a very, in, uh, very interesting area for us, not only for partnership investment, but for other areas of, 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 of exploration. Thanks. You heard it. What, what do you think about our opportunities in collaborative innovation? Uh, is Matis a, a partner for Pepsi there, or, or, or uh, are you seeking investors for your uh, projects? Well, we're not seeking investors at, at Matis, obviously, being a public uh, I'm, research I'm not, yeah. uh, company, but. Um, now, we do have a confidentiality agreement with Pepsi, so I can't yeah. divulge, uh, give you all the details of what we're, what we're doing together. But, but like uh, Dr. Yep said, it's really uh, the uniqueness of, uh, of our environment here in Iceland that I think is, is attractive and, and is going to be attractive to, uh, uh, to outside people, including companies like, uh, uh, like, like PepsiCo. Uh, he mentioned the marine environment. We have a uh, very unique, uh, very pure environment with, with certain interesting species. and, and Throughout the years in, uh, in Matis, we've been uh, exploring ways how to uh, better utilize our uh, seafood resources, you know, take the byproducts, find valuable mo molecules in the byproducts, and develop processes to process these molecules. And then, not just stop there, but actually develop uh, food products containing uh, uh, these ingredients. And in that respect, we've also been looking at uh, new raw materials. Uh, you mentioned seaweed as, as one new raw material. There are interesting species around Iceland we're not utilizing. Um, and then it's the whole microbial environment also in Iceland, uh, both the terrestrial environment and also the ocean, oceanograph, uh, the ocean environment. We have these unique microbes uh, here in Iceland. In fact, our biodiversity in Iceland in microbes is equal to the biodiversity of plants in the Amazon. So there's a lot of interesting molecules that you can be looking at also in that environment. I've, yeah. I've seen two people raise yeah. their hands. First, Sveik Markesson. Uh, 
a lot uh, with the university here in, in, uh, in Iceland and the university system as a whole. But nevertheless, we have a, a problem also with uh, the lower levels of education. We have high levels of dropouts, uh, especially between, uh, at, at the boys' level. So perhaps if you could elaborate a bit uh, on like, how, how do we solve this? Because uh, the challenge is quite big. We need to solve it. Yeah, I totally agree. The challenge is, is large. Uh, what we've been doing with a lot of universities around the world is when we've been finding that some of the curriculum they've been teaching is not exactly uh, right for the environment that we live today. So the, so the curriculum they've been teaching from the first year to the senior, and then they expect them to get positions within leading innovation companies, they're not prepared. So we're looking at really going to the university level and saying, listen, the world has changed around you. Not only have I mentioned that chemistry and biology has changed, but the world has changed the way we look through a different lens, through the consumer, and through health and wellness, and through different areas. You've got to prepare your students a little bit better in these specific areas. So going to the professor, really gearing them to uh, not just teach what we want them to do at PepsiCo, but what's best for the industry overall in food science. Uh, what's, what's best for food safety. The regulatory has changed dramatically, so you shouldn't be teaching old regulatory when there's a brand new uh, regulatory uh, area out there. So uh, we've been going to leading universities that we've been partnering with, really investing in the professors and the department and also in the students through internships to really get them prepared um, in, into moving forward in, into what we see real life uh, today and for the consumer of tomorrow, not just the consumer yesterday. Now, the fortunate piece is the computer industry and the technology has advanced pretty rapidly in, 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 um, in uh, academia. So we've been taking advantage of that through molecular modeling, through areas such as uh, synthetic biology and computer computers and things like that. But we really need to advance more in some of these other specific areas. So another reason we're out here also is from the talent piece, uh, is there possible student interns here in Iceland that we could partner and bring them into the U.S. or into PepsiCo to really do an internship with us in research and development uh, so that we can get a different lens in specific areas? So uh, down to the junior level be, be before college and high school, uh, obviously we have camps and things like that for sports, but we just don't have some of the educational pieces that we need to, except the science fairs. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. My name is Harald. Uh, you talked about some of the emphasis you have in your program uh, and some of your long-term strategic goals. I'm, I'm wondering how do you pick those goals in the, uh, due to the fact that they are long-term? How do, how do you try to understand what the market will be asking for in, say, two to five years? And also, uh, how does PepsiCo fund it's long-term research. Do you, okay. do you get a portion of turnover or? Yeah, so we have, um, you know, when I say long-term, it's not like pharma where it's 10 years, we're two to five years out. So what we look at is what we call foresights or uh, foresight trends. So we look at the trends out there which are coming to us in a, in a fast way and then we try to embrace those trends. So we'll take part of our research money and work on some of those foresights before the consumer is actually asking for it. So we're doing things today that the consumer is not asking for yet, but we know they possibly will ask for that. And then we do some research that from consumer insights where they're, we need it within a, a, a year and a half to two years. So we have a combination of both. Uh, but there's things like, for example, I mentioned some of the challenges that we have. Those actually are foresights. If you look at each one of those bullets or numbers, there's something in there that's telling you that we should be doing something in that specific area, such as in personalization, such as in areas in, uh, in health and wellness, which we're always gonna be addressing, such as in areas for the new consumer. And I really think that's, that's where it's at. The, the consumer of tomorrow, we have, to be caught, we have to be ready for that consumer tomorrow. That consumer tomorrow could be making their own beverage at home instead of us buying it on the shelf. We have to, are we ready for that, that specific area? Is there an appliance out there that you can make your own Pepsi Max or your own different beverages? Um, we have prototypes out there that, uh, for example, in our vending systems and our coolers that, that like I mentioned earlier, that are, are, will personalize some of that beverage to you from a flavor point of view. I know some of you have seen that 
with our competitor, but we're actually going one step better than that um, to understand uh, and to facilitate the consumer for the personalization piece of it. So uh, we take a combination of both. And how we fund it, so we fund it, uh, we have I, we have so much corporate dollars that we, at least we, we take from brands and multiple areas that, that fund our, um, our research. Uh, the reason sometimes the brands fund our research because the, when they really want something in that, then they'll pull it, it helps us then pull it in to get to commercialize a little bit quicker. Then we have partnerships with universities and with other partners that we're actually taking a different model now. Instead of, you know, I think I heard her mention this about not just doing research for the sake of research, we're actually having a milestone, milestones within universities that where we need to, we need to get to commercialization. Uh, we need to get to a certain area of, of possibly shared intellectual property to move forward into a specific area. So we're really pressing uh, kind of the gas pedal really hard to really push the universities to deliver more commercialized research. We have two more questions here in the middle. First, Thrawin Carlson. My name, my name is Thrawin. Thank you for the most interesting and inspiring presentations. Dr. Yap, you mentioned the personalization of products. You, men, uh, you mentioned also the importance of recognized taste in different areas. On the other hand, we have, it seems to be that brands and products are becoming increasingly more international. I was recently traveling in uh, South Africa, and I was amazed going to supermarkets there. I could buy the same products as, as I can buy here in Iceland. How will this uh, be bridged? Well, it's the same, could be the same brand, but for some of the same brands, the same product could be a different formulation for a different taste. So it could be the same, you know, you could get the same Pepsi, the same uh, Frito-Lay looking bottle and looking bag, but I guarantee you some of the taste is, is tailored to the local, local taste people, because what we do is we run through a uh, really strict sensory panel, panelists local, to see which products actually make it uh, to the shelf and first. So we can tweak the flavor or the formula a little bit to, uh, to adjust for certain localized tastes. Now, there's some formulas that we do have global because the global market uh, wants that. They, will, they love different tastes from the US or from Europe or from Asia into those specific areas. So we have a combination of both depending on what the consumer wants. What we try to do is give, you, give the consumer as much opportunity as possible uh, and as much uh, areas as possible for taste to really come up with different types of products. So, uh, you know, like I said, we reach you know, over a billion people a day. Um, you know, are we ready for it to deliver that? We have the largest distribution system uh, in the world. Uh, we have the largest shipping company in the world, more than UPS uh, in specific areas. We have more trucks out there than UPS in specific areas. So. Uh, we, we reach a lot of consumers. Now, what those products look like and taste like, uh, some are localized, some are not, because there's a reason they're not, because of uh, the distribution system or because the consumer wants a different taste than they usually get in that specific area. So uh, it's, it's, it's likely that you are going to see similar looking products, but possibly localized taste. There was a question. Oh, there was a hand. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk, Dr. Yap. I have a, my name is Helga, I have a question for you. Uh, you mentioned that you have discovered new molecules that are developed by nature, and um, then you find out that they, if, whether they have uh, desirable properties. I would like to know what would be the next step. Are you synthesizing these molecules, or what would be the next step in the development? So there's several ways to look at what's coming from nature. One, we could study that uh, natural molecule and uh, see if there's a much natural product out there for us to deliver to the consumer, such as stevia. Uh, there's enough stevia out there that we can uh, supply our consumer with cases and cases of uh, beverages for that. And we can grow stevia around the world, not just in Brazil. We can grow it in, um, in China, and we can grow it in other parts of the world, so it's a more hardy plant. Now, it's a very unique molecule, such as a marine molecule, obviously, we're, you know, we're not going to send divers down there to, to extract that. What we do is we study that, and there's different ways. Now, if the product is artificial, the brand is artificial for that product, then we can synthesize that molecule. 
or you can use areas such as synthetic biology to really look at that. But it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis how we look at that. Because we're, you know, we, we try to practice uh, the sustainability, uh, the, not just human piece, but the environmental piece, we're really aware of the amount of hectares that we use per, uh, per space of, of our natural products and our ingredients as, as we move forward. So, uh, but you gotta remember when you're dealing with taste, a lot of times it's, it's the ingredient only takes a part per million to actually have an effect in the beverage because your mouth is so sensitive to a sweet, salt, or bitter, or, or, or fat that you know, it doesn't take that much uh, natural ingredient to actually make a difference in that product. So, because uh, we're in parts per million. It's already 10 o'clock, but there are still three people with questions here in the room. Uh, I'm wondering perhaps to allow one last question, and for those who still have questions, I'm sure both Dr. Kristensen and Dr. Yeb will be here, and, and uh, they are willing to answer the questions or have a discussion, perhaps for a few minutes. But one last question there. Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, the industry is going towards more healthy uh, products. And uh, basically, if you have a, a choice to, to put one ingredient which costs uh, one dollar uh, to a product, that would be a feasible option. But you could put a ingredient which costs two dollars, which would be a lot healthier. Is there any driving force to put you towards more uh, healthy products in, in, in general? Yeah, I mean, every project that we approach, uh, we try to make our products healthier. So it's not just about money or cost and use. It's about, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're looking at driving the, the salt, fat, and sugar down in all of our products. And you might not even know we're doing it. We're just doing it. Uh, could be doing behind the scenes, uh, but we also are not going to compromise on taste too. Our consumers are demanding uh, a specific taste of that product, and we'll, we'll we'll make sure that we meet that taste requirement, but also making the products uh, healthier uh, for that. So uh, we have our commitments uh, moving forward for salt, fat, and sugar um, by you know by different time periods, and we're we're meeting those goals as we speak. Um, but there's still a lot more work to do to get this, uh, get through uh, all areas of, you know, because we have a lot of products out there, a lot of brands, and uh, we deem some as good for you, some some as better for you, and some as as uh, fun for you. So we have different, like I said, uh, opportunities for the for the uh, for the consumer, and you and you can have different choices of which ones you want. But we, I, I guarantee, you we have a product for you for the choice that you want to have, whether if you want to have indulge yourself with a fun for you product or if you want a healthier product out there. We have different products throughout the day, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, we'll have a product for you. But we're, you know, every time we look at a project, at least myself and my group, we're looking at making that product healthier. Um, and that's just part of how we set up the project. Okay, I'm afraid we will have to end here. Many thanks to the presenters, Dr. Christensen and Dr. Yep. Thanks to you all. Thanks for the questions. Um, I hope you have a great day.